Welcome, guys, to another edition of the SND Podcast Show on the Schmuck Sports Network. Steven is here. Uh, quickly, before we get to Dan, Dan is here. Um, just so you guys know, I apologize for last week. I'm feeling a little under the weather. I hope you enjoyed Dan's video. Dan, how'd that go last week? It went pretty well. Um, unfortunately, I had to borrow my dad's old laptop. Um, it took a little bit while, and I figured it out. I had to do a photo photo booth, and unfortunately, I couldn't stop a few times. So the uh, people have been laughing at my yawn, but it's all good. Yeah, it was fun. It was good to release my stress. Um, a lot of good things happened last week. Um, congrats to the Rangers and the Knicks. Um, well, congrats to the Rangers advancing. Unfortunately, the Islanders storybook uh, series uh, drastically ended against the Penguins. But we'll get in, more into that. But uh, it was overall good feedback. Um, appreciate it for everybody that listened. I'm hopefully going to do some more in the f- in the future. More Met stuff, hopefully. Uh, just so everybody knows, we are we are doing tonight's show via Skype. Uh, yeah, unfortunately I'm sick this week, so I just didn't want to get anybody sick. So hopefully this is just as good as our normal weekly show. Yes, I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, keep in mind, later in the show we're actually going to have uh, Andy back on. He was on with us a couple of weeks ago from EyesOnIsles.com. Yes, I'm very excited for that because uh, Andy gave us great insight. Um, I'm, I'm I'm really interested to see what he thinks the Islanders are going to do in the off season, yeah. and what his take was in the first round of almost surprising the Penguins. Well, um, well, it was interesting. I think it was last night. Um, my friend tweeted that uh, Jeremy Roenick was actually saying that the last night was game one of uh, last night the the, the Penguins fourteenth was the first game of the Penn Sen, Sen series, and uh, Roenick said that the Senators had to start playing more like the Islanders to beat the Pens. So. so that's that's not a a current that doesn't happen often. So that was great to hear. Actually, I saw that it was Matt who tweeted that, right? Yeah. Matt All right. And that's what I thought. Yeah. Then I saw that too. Um. Yeah. And of course, I'm gonna be bitching about the Knicks disgrace. We'll have a nice little just Dan segment complaining about the Knicks. Um. <laughs> yeah. A lot of complaining. Um. Also, we'll see what happens. Congratulations to the Nets. They did get it to the seventh game. Congratulations on that. Yeah, but shame on them for not winning against the Bulls. But we'll get into that as well. Uh, so we have a pack show. We're going to play some more. The song this week is called Freak Show by Division 1.1. We're going to play a little bit more of it and come right back. Back to the S and D podcast. Uh, Dan here with Steve. Um, this week's show is Freak Show by uh, Division One Point One. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a little bit of basketball uh, before we go on with the rest of the show. Um, I'm very frustrated right now. Uh, I'm sure Steve can attest to this, but I'm a little bit of a bigger Nick fan. Um, the last couple of games, the the Knicks have just played outer garbage. And unfortunately, they're just not playing as a unison team that we've seen the whole entire year. Um, the Indiana Pacers have a 3-1 lead. And by the time this show is going to be aired, it's going to be Game 5 as we speak at the moment. Um, today is the 15th as we're recording. Um, just a lot of disappointment right now in Nickland. Uh, Josh Smith still in that slump that we were talking about last week. Um, is Josh playing? Yeah, he's he's yeah yeah he he's he's a he's a total disgrace, and he's just he's just just being a scumbag on the court. Um, he he just has poor body language, and Coach Wichita should just pull his ass out of the game. And it's just despicable. I I want him to play good, uh, obviously because he's wearing a Knicks jersey. But I honestly can't wait for him to be off the Knicks team because I don't see the Knicks having enough cap room for keeping him next year. Um, of course, I would. L- there's as long as he's out. playing well, of course, that's the old ad. There yeah, an there's option. an op out. No, there's, yeah. a, there's an option for him for next year. And they don't play. Oh, th- is there? No, they play Thursday. Yes. Basketball doesn't play every night. No, I know. But they're playing Thursday night, game five. So it's it's just one of those things that the Knicks, uh, unfortunate J.R. Smith is the focal point of the the madness and yelling at it's just the overall team effort um melody even score a point in the fourth quarter and i can't really blame it all on camello 
Um, unfortunately, he's the only one scoring right now. Um, J.R. Smith's not scoring. Tyson Chandler's just getting destroyed by Roy Hibbert. And they're just out-hustling us. I, I really think it's it's not the talent. That is, they're, they're not a better team, per se. Of course, they're winning 3-1, so it's kind of silly for me to say that right now. But it's more of hustle. Um, and if the Knicks start hitting shots, they could easily be back in the series and win in seven. Well, we, um, we, had, um, we had Keith on a little while ago, uh, a couple months ago, talking about the Pacers. Um, because that was when the Knicks and Pacers were going back and forth with the two and three spots. And he's the one who said they're not a scoring team. They're a defensive team. And if you don't put up points against them, you're not going to beat them. Yeah, and then we're seeing that right now. And what's really frustrating with this series is, especially last night, and Reggie Miller and myself and everybody who's actually sat down and watched the game, the only way the Pacers beat us last night was because of offensive rebounds and second-chance shots and the Knicks not making shots. And if the Knicks made half of their shots and were able to grab a man and box out, they would have they would have been able to win this game. And that's what happened game three and four last night, and arguably game one. So as you can see, the Knicks are not boxing out. They're not getting the hustle boards. And there, it's just it's just embarrassing. It's like they're we're watching the Knicks getting getting their manhood taken away. Um, that's the nicest way to say it before I get in trouble. It's really discouraging. Um, especially seeing guys like Tyson Chandler, who you, you expect to be a beast and just always dominant. And it, it's just, just disgusting to see how lackluster they've been playing. And also I, I do have to say about Tyson Chandler, um, he picked the wrong time to talk about. We know they didn't say it was directly towards Carmelo, but we all know it was towards Carmelo. He picked the wrong game to bitch about it after. Carmelo only scored 16 points, and he only shot the ball under under 25 times. If you were going to complain, uh, you, you picked the wrong game to complain. That's from what I'm understanding. Um, granted, it was a whole team effort. Um, last night, they had three guys over double digits opposed to just Carmelo on Saturday night. It's, it's just going to be one game at a time for the Knicks. Um, they they got to believe in each other and start Thursday night and take it one game at a time. And hopefully the garden crowd keeps them alive for at least one more game. And hopefully two, um, the Knicks are too good for this, um, slump. I, I don't know how they got into this awful of a slump. Well, um, well, like you said with the Tyson Chandler thing, now is not the time. No matter what he's saying, it's not the time to be pointing fingers. Exactly. It's, it's, you're, that's, you're in the playoffs. Now's the time to huddle up as a team. Keep it inside the locker room. Especially because you're a final eight team now. There's eight teams left. Yes. So you're, you're now, everything you say is criticized. Oh, and it, and times that by a billion because you're already in the New York media. Right, 100%. And it, it's just a frustrating time as as a Knicks fan and an actual Knicks. It's just, they're just out hustling them in every facet of the game. And it's like, it's really frustrating to watch because they're beating us at our own game. They're hitting three-pointers. Where we're just chucking up shots and bricks, like I said, like I said to whoever I was watching the game with last night, a little bit with my girlfriend before I kicked her out because I wasn't feeling well. Um, like I would rather lose with Chris Copeland on the floor or those guys than watching J.R. Smith chucking up ten sh- of twenty shots and bricking every one of them and just being a disgrace on the floor and just having no emotion on the court and just. You can tell his body language was so negative that even though we were coming back from 10 points, I had no confidence that we were going to win this game last night. Um, Sure, I might have said it on Facebook, but there was no shot of them winning last night. And they, they need to figure something out. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Carmelo's special drinking water, like, uh, like in space jams, another space jam reference. I know. Um, they they just got to figure something out and just play one game at a time. And it's just frustrating to see. Um, unfortunately, the Heat series is going to end tonight by the time our recording's over. Hopefully, I jinxed it. 
But the Heat are just playing at a different level right now. And if the Knicks were to advance right now, unfortunately, the Heat would destroy us. And it wouldn't even be a f- fair series. Yeah, but, that's what, but you know what? It's exactly what was expected, though. Oh, of course. But we we're expecting a little bit more of a fight. It's just everybody's rusty and just in a slump right now. I, I, I'm giving uh, the Pacers credit. They are arguably one of the best defensive teams in the league, but... The Knicks were, should be able to score a little bit more than 70 points a game, you know? They've been averaging over 100, and it's just frustrating to see. Hopefully, we get some home cooking tomorrow. Um, that's all I got to say about the Knicks. It's just very frustrating to watch right now. They are. The Pacers are that, that like, team, if you're not from Indiana and a and, Pacer fan, you hate watching them. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you, if the Knicks weren't, you're you're right about that. And I'll I'll be completely honest with you, I respect uh, the Indiana Pacers so much after watching them this series. I was just like, oh, whatever, they're they're just good defensively, whatever. After watching the first five games, I really respect a lot more out of them. Um, like their defense is amazing. Um, I, w- I always liked a few of their guys, especially Hibbert and. Uh, Tyler Hansborough. I never really heard about George and the other guys before before the season came along. Uh, of course, George won the Most Improved Player, so of course he um, is uh, known around the league now. Um, it, get- it, it's just one of those frustrating things that the Knicks got to keep their head down and just keep on putting the gas pedal on it. And like they said last night, the Knicks have lost two out of the last five games. Oh, one only two out of the last five games. And that's not good, especially in the playoffs, um, unfortunately, obviously. Well, we, we saw it in the in the Celtics series that they started slumping. Yo, yeah, yeah. It, it, it started the minute J.R. Smith elbowed Jason Terry. Oh, yeah, definitely. He, he that, Now he's being too cautious. That now he does. The minute he elbowed Jason Terry, um, his swagger and the Knicks' swagger deflated. It came back a little bit in Game 6 when we clinched in Boston, but the whole swagger, the whole Knicks tape, the whole Knicks tape woo-woo has completely just diminished, and you don't see that. Just You just see individual guys just angry, and a couple of guys, Kenyon Martin, hustling and stats getting with it a little bit. He's still rusty, obviously, because he hasn't played in two months. But you see a couple of guys getting into it. But you see those few guys that are just lost in La La Land, and they got to respond to a TKO punch right now. That they are, they're on the mat right now, and they need to get up and fight for the rest of the rounds in this in this series. Um, and this is their first critical blow, um, and the Knicks just need to survive for one more round and hopefully play see to fa- face another day. It's um, not. It's not surviving to play another another round. It's no, no. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I'm, I was like making a. Six. I'm, I'm making a uh, boxing analogy. Oh, okay. Uh, um. You know what? They they got to they got to take it one quarter at a time. Oh, of course. Tomorrow. That's what I'm saying. They're on the mat right now, and they they need to find a way to get up and be able to deliver another blow, and keep on pounding them and find a way to knock them out. That's what I'm trying to say. One thing they did show this year, there were games this year where they got like destroyed in the first quarter, and then they came out in the second quarter and just started nailing every shot. Exactly. We haven't gotten that this series. No. We got we had that a lot in the Boston series. Um, we, we had that a lot during the regular season, like you said. It's just they've clamped us down, and we're rushing our threes and just playing just utter garbage right now and it's just frustrating to watch and it's just insane who does to even imagine what's going on with that right um like you said there is another series that should be ending tonight um on the 15th uh the miami chicago series it's 11 point game right now in the second quarter yeah the bulls are just like the knicks right now um the Bulls are completely depleted with injuries like how they were in the Nets series. Congrats for them to you barely even getting out of that round. It was a miracle for that. Um, 
well, they were up three one, but that was before Lou Aldang had to get a spinal tap and Heimer and got hurt. This, this and that, and will Derek Rose come back and play? And all it was just a drama filled series after they went up three one. So I'll give them slack for that. Um, the the Heat are just a different animal. Um, there's nothing much to say. They're they're in it to win it and just embarrass everybody. They're that good. Um, that's all I need to say about the Heat. It's it's that it's to that point, and it's that's because I don't want to talk about them. It's just a respect factor that you don't even have to say what they've been doing because they're just destroying teams, and they they're they're doing what I expected. I picked the Heat in five. I thought the Bulls were just going to win just because they're tough for one game, and I think I already got it against in game one. Um, I think I picked that series in six. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully, hopefully, have, hopefully you're right. I know I'm wrong. I mean, I know I'm wrong in the next series. I picked the Knicks in six. Because there were like rumors that they may or may not come back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That That's why I, I figured you picked six. Um. Uh yeah. yeah, you had you I had, had Miami Indi- five and I had the Knicks in six. Oh, I definitely got the Knicks wrong because obviously they, it's impossible for them to win six. Oh yeah, I had Miami you, six, Knicks in seven. Yeah, so you have a shot of being right. Um, with well, the West Coast games have actually been fun. Um, the injury bug hit the uh, Thunder pretty hard. The the Thunder are pretty much going with the going through with the Knicks are going through. Um, just a great defensive team in the Grizzlies and just being able to shut down their one All Star guy while uh, Kevin Durant, I mean uh, Russell Westbrook is injured. So right now the, the Grizzlies are taking care of business and controlling what's going on. Unfortunately, um, a couple what is that games three one. Uh, I believe so, and it could have went either way, but all all the games so far. So, it's it's just very frustrating right now for the OKC fans as well, and their dreams just diminish right now. Yeah, it's three to one Grizzlies, and, the and, they, o- and then the other West was- up tonight if the Grizzlies win, but it's in Oklahoma City, so it's going to be a tough matchup. And then the other series, um, uh, safe to say, Stephen Curry mm-hmm. and. Uh, Kenneth Thomas is officially out of air. Oh yeah, unfortunately the uh, unfortunately that's just it's just it's just rough, and it's you see what happens with uh, you see what happens when uh, just an old veteran team is able to take care of business and just able to just pull it out. Uh, like like I was talking to one of my coworkers um, either today or the other day. Um, you got to respect the Pacers, I mean the Spurs. They're they're always in the mix, but they're always no one likes them. For some reason, oh, they're too boring or they oh, they they don't do the right things or or they always do the right things and they're never predictable and yet yeah, this and that. But Pop and their and their team is just able to get through things and actually that series is yeah, 3-2 San Antonio. So, um yeah, because they split the first four. Yeah, and then the, and then they destroyed them last night. Yeah, one hundred nine ninety one. So the Spurs are just just playing at another level. Um, unfortunately, Stephen Curry, um, the gas is finally running short. It was a great playoff run if they don't prolong it tomorrow. Um, you know, <laughs> honestly, they were they were the team that nobody expected. Ex- exactly. Um. Especially losing and and that and especially losing David Lee, um, one of my all-time favorite Knicks during the bleak years. Um, he he's a, one of the most underrated players in the league, and Mark Jackson did a phenomenal job for getting them into the playoffs. Let alone, let alone advancing in of best around. So, got to give credit where credit's due. Um, unfortunately, they they're running up a little short against a better and more experienced team. That's what it really comes down to. Playoffs is experience, and they know how to get things done. Every now and then, stupidity and young underdogs are able to prevail. But more times than not, the more experienced and better team will win. 
as you see in all the series right now, except for the Knicks, half the series right now. The other two series is hard and grit with their defense and the other teams not being able to fight back. Um, I'll tell you what, if it does end up being Memphis and San Antonio, it's going to be an interesting series. It's, that's definitely going to be an interesting series. I I would take the Pacers and uh, not Pacers, so I, uh, the Spurs and seven. That 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 would be fun because it'll be interesting to see uh, who would go up against Gasol and Randolph. Mhm. And then you have uh, not Rudy Gay. Who's the big scorer on them now? Uh, Rudy, it's uh, it's what's his face? It's uh, Randolph. It's Randolph, yeah. It's pretty much Randolph, and they're they're and just Connelly's a rat tat. Team. Well. Yeah, and Gasol's playing well. They're just a rat tat team, um, pretty much. Let's see, let's get their scoring. It, it's just, they're just playing hard right now, and they're like just the kicking team. butt. Yeah, that that exactly. Mark Gasol, one player, defensive player of the year. That was another thing. I I do have to pick a bone, and you could tell how much of a joke awards are in the NBA. For the back-to-back years, I'm not sure if it's going on a lot longer. But the last, I know of the last two years, since I'm a Nick fan and I know Tyson Chandler did it last year. How doesn't the Defensive Player of the Year not make first-team defense? Can Can you explain that to me? <laughs> like, like two years in a row, uh, Marcus Saul and Tyson Chandler both win Defensive Player of the Year, but yet they don't actually make the first team defense that makes like, no sense I, I i i don't i don't get that well while we're speaking of words what did you think of the uh nba coach of the year um that was a good that was very good um surprising surprising they had a great year like we've been we've been saying it all year um i guess everybody's tired of the heat so our my call was uh a little out dated but carl did deserve it um, it yeah, was based the third guy. Yeah, it it was purely based of the season. If it was obviously about playoffs, there's no shot in hell he would have made it. Um, obviously, since they flunked out of the first round, like always. Uh, congrats to them. Uh, we got the rookie of the year right, so congrats to us on that. And the MVP. And we of course we got the MVP. <laughs> we would be idiots, so we're like that one guy that picked Mello. <laughs> Um, Just because um, the most surprising part about the Coach of the Year award was that Thibodeau ended up in like eighth place in voting. Yeah, I I don't know why. <laughs> What's the hate on Thibodeau? I I he I think he's arguably the best coach in the league. I think it was Evan Roberts who said that he has no contract and he's the one guy he wants to be the next coach. Oh yeah, of course. That would that would be it. I I did hear a rumor though that uh that Darren Williams wants uh Jerry Sloan. Oh, that that's that's just the goof rumor. Of course he was gonna say that just to make it sound like he's a coachable guy. And so. that he didn't have him fired a couple of years ago in Utah? Uh, exactly. <clears throat> Excuse well, me, pretty well, much. Well all I know is Phil Jackson already said no. Yeah, no, no way. That's happening. But I he's think an advisor Phil, to finding a coach for Detroit. That's weird. <laughs> he he's enjoying the beach in California with uh, the Lakers owner's uh, daughter. What, what do you think of this? Like, think about this. Clippers fire their coach. Phil Jackson comes in and coaches the Clippers. Yeah, I don't Doesn't see that. Doesn't have to leave LA. I don't, I don't see that happening. I think he's done. Thank you. Um, I think he's just just flirting with teams just to be that guy. That guy. But when it comes to said and done, they have to win like right now. Like he, he, the only team he would go to would be like the Heat. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that would be the only team. Like maybe the Thunder before Westbrook got hurt, maybe. But. I think I think the Clippers are overrated. Granted, they had a great year. The only way I can see him doing being the Clipper coach, though, would be if they guarantee Chris Paul resigns. Yeah, guarantee Chris Paul signs is going to be huge. Because you need him to run the top of the triangle. Well, yeah, and he is the best player. I think Blake Griffin is the, one of the most overrated players in the league. No question about it. But in that system, I think he would work out well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But... 
I just I still think he's all dunk and all rebound. He needs to work a lot of it on his game. And his Kia commercials were funny like three months ago. I'm kind of getting tired of it. <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm just throwing it out there. Alrighty. Well, this was basketball for the week. Let's go play some more uh, Division One Point One Freak Show. Come and... on, come on. I don't want to do a recap show next week. Let's do this. And let's. Uh, we'll be back with Andy from Eyes on Isles. S and D podcast is in no way affiliated with, associated with, produced, or endorsed by the National Basketball Association or any of its affiliates. <laughs> And welcome back to the s and Podcast Show on the Schmuck Sports Network. Steven is here, Dan via Skype. And we hey, guys. Welcome to the show, Andy from Eyes on Isles via Skype. How are you, Andy? Welcome back, hey, Andy. On. Great. How about yourself? Very well, very well. So the Islander season is uh, over. And like we were discussing before, my view is we played six more games than we were supposed to. So I take that. Uh... I take that as my bright side of it. And uh, how did you feel about it, Andy? Um, at first, I was happy we made it. Uh, once we got in and, and tied the series at two, I really felt that we had the upper hand. Um, and I, I honestly, at that point, my philosophy switched from happy to be there to want to win. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, I was a little disappointed. Um, in game six, I ended up watching the second, third period in overtime standing up. And that's the truth. I was standing up in my living room. <laughs> and um, I think when, when Orpik scored that goal, I just kind of sat there and stared at my TV for a good five to seven minutes because I couldn't believe that it was over. But I agree with you. It was very, very positive all around. And, and it, was, it was a good thing for the Islanders that we made it and got the three games of extra home revenue as well, which is very important to Wang, as we know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, get, Saturday night stunk for me, um, obviously, with the Islanders losing in overtime and the Knicks actually stinking up the joint. So I was 0 for 2 that night as well. I was, like, I agree with Andy. Um, unfortunately, they played six more games than we expected. Um, beginning, I was just happy to be make the playoffs. And then as the series got on, it was just a false hope. And we were so close on uh, just taking the Penguins. What what did you think we could have done a little bit better as a team to actually suppress, uh, go past the, these Penguins if we had a shot doing it today? Um, well, I, when I was on with you guys a couple of weeks ago, I was the only one at that point that was screaming about how I wasn't scared to play the Penguins. And believe it or not, after game one, I still wasn't, wasn't frightened of them only because I thought that game one were total deer in headlights. Oh, yeah. Like we bo- like all three of us called. Oh, it's horrendous, that first game. Um, but then, at, 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 you know, the Penguin offense, you're not going to stop them. You're not. Uh, absolutely not. What you're looking for, though, is that game-changing, that momentum-changing save from your goaltender. And it just needs to be won, right? We see it all the time yeah. when Henry Lundquist on the Rangers. He makes a huge save you get this infusion of confidence, this infusion of energy. The Rangers, typically within five minutes of a huge lunk with save, have a great chance of scoring a goal. Nabokov never gave us that in this series. Never Absolutely gave us that. Um, the goal he gave up to Douglas Murray in game five, you could see it just suck the life out of the team. They played a good first period that, that game five. He gives up that goal to make it 2 nothing from the blue line on that floater that he just thought he was a juggler and not a goaltender. And... That game was over right then. So yeah. the old, just everything came at, got sucked out of the Islanders at that point. Um, so I, that's, that's a big point. The other thing is the power play. Penguins came in with the 25th ranked penalty kill, and we just did not take advantage of, of the power play when we had to. Yeah, uh, um, you hit it on the head on both. Um, that, I was just going to add to the, the Bokoff. I think he he um kept, he was pretty erratic. Granted, you were ex- going to expect that with the Penguins. Um, that that goal with Murray um in Game Five was the complete backbreaker. I think in the series, um, everything was going decent in that game, and the first goal, the two out of the three goals in that period were nice shots that you're going to tip your hat to. But that goal was an absolute backbreaker. Um. 
Who who other than um who did you who was your MVP of this series in the Islander aspect? I think it was Kyle Oposo. He Absolutely. played it he played his head off. And that was that was the Kyle Oposo that we've been waiting for for the last few years. And that was the true grit. He even got in a couple of fights. He was just in the mix of everything. And that's why I always liked Kyle Oposo and I'm I'm happy to see him finally getting what he was supposed to be. What's your take on Kyle Oposo from this playoff series? He, he literally matured right before our eyes um, when you really look at where he came. And, and that's how he, he has been playing the last seven weeks. I mean, even the last you know, five to six weeks of the regular season, he just something clicked with him and he turned into an absolute beast um, in every single zone, offensive zone, neutral zone, defensive zone, fighting for pucks in the corner. As you said, his fight with Matt Niskanen, pretty much turned this series on its head. It's kind of when the Penguins said to themselves, wow, you know, we're really in a dogfight here. We're really not going to sweep this series. Um, and, you know, the easy answer would be John Tavares, who also had a great series. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think everything was on Oposo. He just literally did it all. Um, the shorthanded goal that he scored in the third period um, in, the, in the game that the Islanders won on the island, 5-4, was uh, 6-4 rather, was... Again, series changing. Everything he did, you could point to as being a series changing moment. I felt. Um, you say that about Oposo, and uh, we will get later on with you we'll talk about the the upcoming off season for the Islanders. But adding on with Oposo plus the off season, what do you think? Do you think that because of the way he played, he showed that hey, maybe we can now move him up to the first line and put him with Tavares? Because he's like a big body guy who can actually push guys around through with Tavares and protect Tavares a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, JT necessarily needs protection. I think we saw a little bit of frustration the last couple of weeks of the regular season with JT. Um, I think the most important thing you have to have in this league is balance, right? So you don't really yeah. want your top three on that first line. I think that... Kyle Poso clearly has um, something special, especially with Franz Nielsen. So I, I personally, I would rather the Islanders look for a replacement for Brad Boys on that first line than move up Poso there. Okay. Um, now back to the, the Bakov thing. Uh, he's never been a good playoff goalie. But the two no. games that we did pull, pull him in, um, games one and five, Poulin came in and played really well. What was your take on seeing him play pretty well in those games? I was nervous. Um, I think that it kind of helped that the game was so out of hand, believe it or not, because it wasn't like putting Poulin into a tremendously high-pressure situation, even though it was the playoffs. Both games were way out of hand at that point. Um, but I thought, he, I thought he played very composed. I thought he played very well. He controlled his rebounds well. His Positionally, he was good. Um, I would have... I was toying with the idea in my own head about potentially starting him in Game 6, believe it or not. Only because Nabokov, to me, was that bad. You're not going to win a playoff series against any team with an 8.50 save percentage. Exactly. And, and also with that, um, which was surprising, everyone complained about Flurry, but nobody complained about how bad Nabokov was playing the whole series. It was almost a series of which goalie can play worse. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was actually the opposite of the spectrum of the thing. Uh, pretty much, uh, I thought we were going to sink or sh- uh, sink or swim with Nabokov. So, um, I, I, it was just a catch-22 um, with the Islanders. We, he took us this far, far, and I wasn't ready to trust a 20-year-old goalie in uh, Poulin, unfortunately. But, like you said, he didn't help us out at all. Um, but I, I think for this year, let alone, it was just a sink or swim kind of day. I agree. That makes sense. Um, now, what did you think? Did you think the uh, the AMAC injury at all, Andy, played a factor in the series? Yeah, definitely. I think that you look at a guy who was averaging 27 minutes per game, you take him out of your lineup, one of your most reliable defensemen. Him and Ham, you know, him and Hamannick were pretty much the Islanders' top pairing in that series. You know, Hammer, I think, only made one glaring mistake that I remember um, in the entire series. He played 
absolutely outstanding and irritating Evgeny Malkin every chance he had. Even through Crosby to the ice a bunch of... Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, Hamannick was literally stepped up huge. And to take AMAC out of that lineup at that juncture of the series was big for the Islanders because now you throw in Radek Martinek, who has a little bit of playoff experience but hasn't played in a long time. Um, now you have to choose between Matt Karkner, who's got limited mobility, um, and really became Matt Cook's ragdoll the last couple of games, to be honest. Cook wrecked him a couple times. And, or, you know, a smaller guy in like a Thomas Hickey, who played great for the Islanders throughout the season. Outstanding waiver wire pickup, but, you know, in that kind of series, especially coming off two games of being scratched, you ha- kind of have to wonder, A, where his confidence was at that level. Right, especially after the way he played. I thought he actually played pretty bad in game one right. also, which is yep. why they took him out of the lineup. Put more muscle. I kind of, uh, yeah, I, I thought Cardiner should have stayed in the game for a little bit more muscle uh, post the, the hickey switch. That that was a little baffling to me. Um, well, one thing I think, Howie Rose said it in game five, the one advantage with Martinek was that all those years in the past that he was an Islander, him and Brendan Witt were the shut down defenseman for the New York yep. Islanders. Yep, that's correct. So he ha- he knew what he had to do. It's not like you brought a guy in like Thomas Hickey who didn't have that experience. That right. was the one advantage of Martina. And that's a catch twenty two also, right? Because you say to yourself, well, you know, you'll never know what you have in these guys if you don't put them out there in these situations. You have to see what you have, and that's kind of how I feel about Kevin Poole. And not that I think. I think you guys are right in the sense that you don't want to throw a 20-year-old, especially against an offense like Pittsburgh's, into that series. But at some point, we're going to have to see what we have in goal with, you know, with Kevin Poulin and Miko Koiskinen. We're going to have to see what we have with these guys. Well, well, Miko, I think didn't we cut Miko? No, he's still there. I thought Miko was sent overseas. Yeah, but he's still he's still our property though. Oh, he is still the property. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but so a little push to the off season talk. Um, what do you think the Islanders will do? I know Nabokov doesn't have a contract. What do you think they will do? I know I read this week. I think it was Galoff who tweeted out that the Islanders are going to look to keep course with the young guys. So what do you think they're going to do goaltender wise? Here's the thing. The, the free agent market this year is absolutely horrendous. It's probably one of the worst that I can remember in a really long time. So you're not really going to find any guy, anybody on that's an unrestricted free agent that's worth signing. So now you have to turn your attention to uh, like what we just talked about. Do you build from within and see what you have in, in a Koiskinen, an Andres Nielsen, or a Kevin Poulin? You maybe go out and I, I think Snow is going to t- take the patient route like he always has, like he's done through this whole rebuild. Uh, the cap's going down $6.5 million dollars. Teams are going to have to cut players. There's going to be amnesty buyouts. I think I was having a great conversation the other day on Twitter with Jeff Capolini of WFAN and uh, Anthony Stabile regarding potentially Roberto Luongo coming back to the Islanders if he is bought out under the amnesty clause. Wow, that would be that would be interesting. It's, we could it's put him in DPH or in Bridgeport. The Islanders, yeah, oh, absolutely. I don't. I think you've seen the last of Rick DiPietro at the NHL level. I think that uh, I'm not jumping on the buy him out bandwagon just yet because I think Wang will keep him around just for his salary. But it keeps him by the cap floor. That's the key. Right. I don't think you see Rick DiPietro in a at the NHL level again, and that's unfortunate because he really worked hard to get back. I don't take anything away from Rick personally. Uh, physically and, and performance-wise, though, he just can't get it done at this at that level anymore. Um, one one name goaltender-wise, my dad brought up to me was interesting was Ryan Miller. Ryan Miller. Um, after seeing the sh- the shenanigans that he pulled in Buffalo this year, I'm not sure I want Miller anywhere near my clubhouse if I'm the Islanders. What exactly ha- happened? And well, uh, what I I, I wasn't, wasn't following wasn't, the Sables a lot. Really he, happy. He wasn't happy, and he just pouted the whole season? Okay, gotcha. Pulling his teammates out, there'd be times when, he, like, let's say he'd get, I mean, a goal was scored, let, let's say deflected off his defenseman accidentally, or someone made it, you know, blew a coverage. He would literally, I mean, there was a couple times that I saw him literally in the crease after the goal was scored, throw his arms off like a 15-year-old kid that's playing on the street. Um, it was really baffling to me, because he's always been a consummate pro, but look back at 
Ryan Miller's career stats, save for one season, I believe, when he might have won the Vesna that season. Um, to me, he's just an average goaltender. Right. He really is. I, I know that's he's kind of high profile and Olympics and stuff like that, USA goalie, but at the end of the day, his statistics are pretty ordinary when you really look at them. Yeah, well, if Team USA next year is going to be Jonathan Quick. Absolutely. If he, uh, if he stays healthy. Um, let's see. What else? Um, so, I, I, it's just frustrating. Um, do you think we need any more defensemen? Uh, yep. <laughs> well, uh, all right. Well, something just came out today about the potential of, and again, I'll go back to Vancouver because they seem to be in a lot of uh, cap trouble, obviously. Um, about them possibly using their amnesty buyout on like a Keith Ballard, who I think would be a good fit on the island. Um, don't forget, too, another speedy winger. If I can switch up front for a minute, that may oh, be okay. some service to the Islanders is Mason Raymond, who's going to be an unrestricted free agent in Vancouver. Um, then you got to look at the trade market. Like I said, the, the free agency market is so thin, Garth's going to have to look at amnesty buyouts and trades to improve this club. I'd love to see the Islanders go after Keith Yandel but I think the price is going to be way over our head. Right. Um, well, of course, we go back to the whole patience thing with Gar Snow, and then you look at what's in Bridgeport of Matt Donovan and... Uh, and um, the Han, if he can ever get healthy. The Han, if he could ever get healthy, was a, I think it was 12th overall pick. Yep. Um, and they had a bunch of defensemen in the minors that they just feel like... But then again, we could also see come the first week of the season, some random guy on waivers that he that Gar Snow goes to pick up. Right. And he becomes our number three defenseman this year. So I think we're still two to three. We're probably two years away from realistically seeing Griffin Reinhardt. I don't think we see Griffin Reinhardt this year. I think that defensemen come along a lot slower than forwards at this level. So I, I really don't think the Islanders, seeing what they did with Nino Niederreiter, I don't think they're going to be in any rush to move Griffin Reinhardt through the defense. Well, with him, it's... It's his size that plays a factor in him. He's a big guy, but he also just got hurt recently. Yep. Um, and I think was out, I think they said like six to eight weeks, starting like two weeks ago. So that, of course, will push him back. I, I see him in camp in September. <clears throat> right, I agree. And then being one of those last guys, stay here, maybe we'll play you in, in the third game of the season, and then you're going back to juniors type thing. Right. I think, I think another year in juniors and then a year at the in Bridgeport would probably serve him the best for his development before he gets up to the up to the NHL level. Bearing injuries to guys above him, of course. Right. Um, and you were speaking of forwards. Um, you people don't realize that they're actually getting a guy who had like a hundred and something points this past year in his junior season in Ryan Strom next season. Do you think he makes the team out of uh, camp? I do. I think it's it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. I think that Strom, who is uh, close with John Tavares, I think he Tavares's work ethic and passion and intensity is kind of rubbing off on Strom. Um, I do think Strom gets the invite to camp. I think he makes the team. I think he's probably our second line center, putting Franz in a more comfortable third line role. The thing with Strom, as with any prospect, is you just don't know. Um, are you looking at the next, you know? Taylor Hall, or are you looking at the next Pat Falloon? You know, I mean, right, you really, right. until they get up to this level, I don't care what they did in juniors, it's impressive, but until they get up to this level and start playing against men that, uh, that's, you know, some of them outweighing them by 40, 50, 55, 60 pounds, um, then we really get to see what we got. So while I'm tremendously excited about Strong, I think he's going to be a good player. I'm not ready yet to anoint him a great player. You're not ready to call him the next Wayne Gretzky. Right, exactly. Uh, and another guy that's been a big topic in the, at the start of this year and why he didn't get called up, is Nino going to finally make the team this year and actually play and not be on the fourth line like he did two years ago? If the Islanders are to improve, uh, as I said, it's not going to be through unrestricted free agency. It's going to be through shrewd uh, acquisitions of amnesty buyouts or waivers or trades. If there's a trade to be had, it's probably it, it almost has. He's going to be it. Almost has to because I can't oh. see the Islanders moving anybody else that's got that kind of value. Makes sense. Um, make, it does make sense. 
Um, but we also saw in the in game six of the season another top prospect is uh, is Brock Nelson. Yes. Um, now, towards the end of the Bridgeport season, the line was Strom, Nielsen, and Nino. Is there a possibility of seeing that line next year as our as a line on Long Island? Like, well, since they're all young, start them off as like the third line. That's could be, but then again, you have to think to yourself, well, what happens to the guys that are still there, um, the veterans? You're, you're not going to see too many of these young guys trump the veterans just yet. The Islanders only have three major, you know, who I consider to be major free agents, guys who played a prominent role, and that's Nabokov, defenseman Mark Streit, and Brad Boyce. So, well, well Streit signed. No, 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 Streit, Streit signed, sorry. Right, I'm talking about Mark Streit, the captain. Yeah. We, so we got Mark Streit, we got Boyce, and we got Nabokov. So that's only three. So I don't think you're going to see, I mean, if that was to happen, if you were to create a Bridgeport line at the NHL level like that, they would almost have to be your fourth line, maybe? Because you're not going to get rid of a Matt Martin. You're not going to get rid of a Casey Sezikis. You know what I mean? You're not going to get rid of guys like that. So, oh, absolutely well, not. The way, the way I see it is your fourth line could end up being Colin McDonald, um, Martin, and Sezikis um, type line. And then you also have to realize Josh Bailey is a restricted free agent this year as well. So... He might actually go out, and they might just look to get leave, let him go. So that gives you a spot. And like Rich you said, said was Josh Bailey. The problem there is Josh Bailey's agent and Garth Snow did like not that. exactly <laughs> get along harmoniously uh, last time they had to do a, a an extension for Josh. So that that is a good point. That's kind of a scary. The Josh Bailey situation is a little bit scary for me because I think. He as well is developing into a really, really nice NHL player. Another another restricted free agent is actually David Alstrom as well. Next season, yeah, they signed him. I think. I don't it, think that's it, an issue. He'll definitely be a guy who signs. Um, I just think I just think that they're not gonna. You know, all those guys. It, it's probably unrealistic to expect all those guys to beat out all those veterans for jobs in training camp. I think that. And and then you're gonna have to they have to sit down and really look at what's best for that player's development, right? Is it best to have, let's say, a Brock Nelson or an Anders Lee playing six minutes a night at the NHL level, or playing 18 minutes a night at the AHL level? Right. And being ready in case you need them, exactly. in case of injuries. Um, of course, I know a lot of people who complain because Anders Lee, of course, his first game and he had a goal, and they're like, oh, he's amazing. You know, he looked out of place, though. To me, he looked he looked. The game looked a little fast for him still. Right. Keep in mind, he was just coming off of yeah. college. And also, the plan was never to play him again after that one exactly. game. See, like, the game didn't look too fast for Brock Nelson. He, like, literally was oh, thrust right into that playoff scenario and, and had a really nice game in the seven minutes he played. His, his first shift, he looked a little like, uh-oh, I'm on the ice. What <laughs> do I do? And then after that, he just took his body and just said, yeah. forget it. I'm just going to slam every guy into the boards. and played really well and deservedly so he played really well um they didn't even think he was going to play because they thought he was only going to play if uh, franz didn't play right, right. now let me ask you about franz since you said he'll probably be moved down to the third line if there's a package if there's a if someone offers you something for franz is he getting moved <clears throat> i would move him absolutely um, I think that it's got to be for what the Islanders need, though. I, and I think that that's where Garth Snow is very underrated as a general manager. I think that uh, the running joke on him when he first got hired was, you know, who's this guy? He was just playing goalie yesterday. You know, he was just a backup goalie with the huge shoulder pads. And from that, he's really come to the point where I was shocked that he wasn't nominated for the GM of the Year award this year. That's how shot, that, that's how much praise I have for the job that he's done. Um, so, but I think that if someone's going to dangle, let's say, a Keith Yandel or uh, a top goaltender, I'm not talking about a Jonathan Bernier who could go either way. could be good. He might not be good. We really haven't seen a lot of him because L.A.'s buried him behind Jonathan Quick. But a proven, tested goaltender or a Keith Yandel-type defenseman, I almost think if they want a Nino or a Franz back, you have to listen. You have to listen because with the prospects coming up from the bridge, as we've been saying, you have to trade from your position of strength. And your position of strength right now for the Islanders, believe it or not, is offense. Right. 
Um, final Islander question. Opening day next year, who's the starting goaltender? If you had a, if you had to pick one guy who's a restricted free agent in the system, the back of who's your opening day starter next year? Wow. Yeah, I threw that one out there. That that's a good one. I'm gonna <laughs> say. Yes, I know we were talking before. You're a big uh, Arofsky fan out of Columbus. Uh, I like Bobo. Uh, Bobo kind of came out of nowhere. I always thought he was a good goalie. I never thought he was a Vesna Trophy winner, but. Um, to do what he did on that Columbus team was pretty remarkable, to be honest with you. And uh, I think Nabokov's desire to stay, and at his age, I think he's, he gets something done with the Islanders. Maybe it's only a one- or two-year deal. It can't be more than two years. If it's more than two years, we're really in trouble. But um, you know what? I, I think I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to echo what, what my buddy Jeff and Anthony Stabile, we were talking about this on Twitter. I have to echo, actually, it was Anthony Stabile who first came out with this about Luongo. And when you think about it, it makes a ton of sense. Um, the Canucks almost have to amnesty buy him out because nobody's going to want to trade for Luongo at that salary and that existing contract. And that's what you get when you trade for him. So I think he gets bought out, and I think Snow makes the call. Um, Luongo obviously sees the improvement the Islanders have made on the ice, the product on the ice. He's obviously got, I mean, not deep roots here, but he's, he was a part of the organization at one point. Um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's Luongo and Nabokov. Hmm. Interesting. What do, you, what do you think, Steve? I, I honestly think it will be Nabokov with Poulin as the backup. I think that they're going to work out a nice deal with Nabokov where it is only one year and the money is not terrible where later in the season, like when they traded Chris Osgood, when they traded away Chris Osgood, that's what they're going to try and look to do with Nabokov. Keep him for another year and midway through the year, they're going to call teams and say, hey, do you need a goalie? Yeah, I, agree. I actually agree with you. They're going to take the route that they did with Di Pietro. Um Granted, he is not a first pick overall kind of thing, so they'll have a little bit more grace period of him actually playing since he was the backup this whole entire year and no one's really calling for him to start. Um, I think it's going to be Nabokov's job. Uh, they're going to find a way to uh, get him back, maybe for cheaper than expected, but you never know. And they're going to battle for a job, but Nabokov's going to play for the most part and then he's going to get traded for a team that uh, needs a goalie, leadership goalie, to make the playoffs. So, that was the Islanders. While we have Andy on, uh, we are the s and Podcast Show on the Schmuck Sports Network. Uh, Steven is here, Dan via Skype, and Andy from eyesonisles.com via Skype as well. Um, there is still eight teams left in the NHL playoffs. Uh, what's your take on the second round, Andy? Uh, we just did our we put our eastern and western previews up at Eyes on Isles yesterday. Um, <clears throat> I think that Detroit Chicago is is going to be a little closer than some people think. Um, the games they played during the regular season, outside of a seven to one walloping that the Hawks gave the Wings, were very hotly contested. I think that series goes seven, but I really see the Hawks winning out based on their depth. I think they're too deep at forward for Detroit, but. You know, you can't take away from the Red Wings. You know, that consecutive playoff streak is not a fluke. They're there for a reason. And that's why I think that makes that a tougher series than most think. L.A., San Jose, it's going to be a battle of goalies. You have Anton Niemi, who won a Stanley Cup on one side. Jonathan Quick, reigning con Smythe winner on the other. Last night was a 2 nothing game. Uh, I think that's going to be a close series throughout. At eyes, our preview had the Sharks in six in that one, only because I felt pretty good about how the Sharks looked against the Canucks. I know the Canucks kind of laid over a bit, but the Sharks just, to me, they looked different. They looked more composed in that series than I've ever seen them before, and they might just be ready to drop that choker label. Um, In the East, Pittsburgh, Ottawa, what can you say about Pittsburgh? The thing you can say about Pittsburgh is they might be thanking the Islanders very shortly because the Islanders might have exposed the flaws in their game which I didn't see last night I didn't see the defensive zone turnovers I didn't see the jittery clears by the defensemen Um, so whether Ottawa needs to wake up really fast it was alarming to see such a well coached team 
not look, I'm not saying they weren't ready to play. They didn't look ready to play. Whether they were or weren't, I'm not in the locker room, but they didn't look to me like they were ready to play that game. Um, Boston and the Rangers, what can you say? Typical, grind it out, mucking in the corners, hard hitting. But I think when you look at a series like that, I, as much as it pains me, I can't root against Henrik Lundqvist. He's the best goalie right now of the remaining teams in the tournament. And I think that he gives the Rangers not only a chance to win every night, but he gives the Rangers a chance to win scoring only one goal every night. And he has shut out the Caps the last game, six, game six and seven. So he still has that shutout streak going. So. There's, there's a definition in my mind of an MVP. I'm not taking anything away from the three finalists, Tavares, Crosby, or Ovechkin, who actually I will take a look from Ovechkin based on his comments yesterday, which proved that he's still the same selfish player that he's always been, and not material. Um, if there's a true definition of an MVP, the most valuable player to his team, I mean, I got to say that Henrik Lundqvist fits that bill perfectly in my mind. Uh, Absolutely. Um, with Henrik, it's he will make seventy. He'll, he'll, I'm just obviously throwing out the number. He'll he'll make seventy saves and he'll get like the seventy first save and everybody's like whoa why didn't he make that save and it's like maybe if the offense scores a goal or maybe the defense book checks a little bit better he would have made that save it's like nine out of ten times it's someone else's fault and it Absolutely. and it's and it, it's it's incredible to see and Henrik I, I I hope Henrik wins because he he deserves everything he gets. Because he, he, he works his butt off with everything he does. Um, well, I, well, one joke that was going around was that, can you imagine Lundqvist on the Islanders against Pittsburgh? We, we would have won in five. <laughs> we we would have won, won five. We outplayed the Penguins four of six games and lost four games to two. Why? Because of goaltending and our power play. Yeah. And that's what scares me the most about the Rangers right now is that yes. if Rick and Nash learns how to put the puck in the net again. That's correct. They're going to be the most dangerous team in the playoffs right now. I totally agree with you. That um, that, but I'm not scared of the Bruins' power play as well. Their power play is pretty bad. Well, not pretty. Bad. They're pretty just as bad, but they can wake up at any moment because they do have the key guys like the Rangers do, like guys like Chara and Sagan and. Bergeron and yada yada yada, but there's obviously no quit in the Bruins as you saw the other night in that most dramatic game seven as anybody has ever seen. Everybody, oh, while watching the Ranger game, everybody was counting. Oh, Sam and uh, oh, congratulations to the Maple Leafs. It looks almost all but done. And then five minutes later, like, oh my God, the Maple Leafs have uh, have choked this away, and you're like, are you kidding me? It's just. Congrats to the Bruins on that. That was that was just insane. There's only two things I feel that can beat the Rangers in that series because I think they match up really well man to man with the Bruins. I, I agree. And, and, and they have the edge and goal. So there's only two things that can do the Rangers in in that series. One, if Claude Julien uses Chara as an offensive weapon more, like he did at the end of that game seven against Toronto, where he sits Chara in front of Lundqvist. As you just alluded to before, which was a great point, the shots that Lundqvist lets in are either the ones that are deflected or the ones that he can't see. So if you look at what Julian did, two minutes left, down two to Toronto, game seven, he plants Chara right in front of James Reimer and says, don't move. And you can see Chara just throwing people aside. Like he couldn't even be budged. And lo and behold, Bergeron just flips one toward the net from the blue line with Chara right in Reimer's way. And so if they can do more of that, that's trouble for the Rangers because Lundqvist can't stop what he can't see. And if the Rangers don't manage the Bruins' momentum, the Bruins right now must be feeling an epic sense of karma, like they can't lose. Absolutely. Who, who wins a game down, game seven down 4-1 with 10 minutes left in the third? I mean, if they manage that, if they manage the Bruins' surge in that sense and keep the front of the net clear, I don't, I don't see Boston beating them in that series. The, the thing with Boston, I hate to bring up the tragedy. Um, they they are Boston's team right now. Uh, if there there's absolutely no arguing with that right now. They are Boston's team, um, right. especially coming back from three zero 
I mean, a three, uh, four to one lead with five minutes left in the period, about to go home. They, they, they showed why Boston is strong. Right. And th- that win overall just shows how tough America is and how tough the Boston community is. And that ha- that's going to be crazy. T- the first two games on how rocking Boston is going to be, right. and it's up to the Rangers veterans and everybody else going to be able to take care of business right um they're gonna have to take the first couple punches as you can see they were very shaky the first three road games in the washington series they had zero offense and until game seven they finally woke up it's going to be interesting to see which ranger team shows up and plays tomorrow night on thursday the 16th but see that's Um, with the Rangers, though they can, they can. If if you look at those games in Washington, even the if you look at the three games in that series that they lost, they should have won all of them except one, for the uh, game one. One game was nothing, nothing. One game was one one, and that's the scary thing about the Rangers. If I mean, if you're a Ranger fan, it's a great thing. But as as, uh, as other teams playing them, it's scary in the sense that they only need one or two because they play such shutdown defense. Right. Um, before we let you go, Andy. There's eight teams left. Stanley Cup Finals out of the eight teams left. <laughs> You're going to ask me to make a prediction again, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Islanders are out. You can't have a fan prediction. <laughs> well, since the last time you guys had me on, and I, I really was, was talking up the Canucks, and that really went against me, huh? In the... <laughs> yeah, so be I, careful who you root for, because I really... might have to pick somebody else. <laughs> I think you should root for the Rangers. Just you know, say it's good, because we're following the NHL rules, right? Each round I get to re... It gets reseeded, so right. it, it's cool. It's like a, it's like a bracket, so you can't really hold that come up pick against me. That just that just went against me. Um. All right. Let's see. Well, like I, I'm going to stick with our eyes on Isles predictions that we made yesterday on the website in our series previews. I'm going to go Chicago San Jose in the Western final, and I'll go Ottawa Rangers in the Eastern final. I still think Pittsburgh's mistakes come back to bite them. I think that those. Mistakes they made against the Islanders will show up again. And um, and then, you know what? Man, rangers Ottawa that would be a hell of a series, wouldn't it? Um, Craig Anderson's probably playing, well, I'm saved for last night. I still think Lundqvist, this is his time. I think this is the year he carries them to the finals against Chicago. I think you could see a Rangers-Blackhawks final if everything shakes out. And you know what? I, have, I, me back, have me back on if that pans out. I'm not going to make a prediction on who I think would win that series yet. Okay, if that if that's the series. Yeah, we'll definitely have you on. For the finals, we'll have you back on either way. How does that sound? That sounds great. So we'll definitely do a finals preview with you. Um, we would like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Thanks check so him out. On, fun. Thanks for having me on. Check him out. Uh, Eyesonisles.com. Um, it's a great site. I check it out every day now. Um, everybody else should like him on Facebook, follow the Twitter page. Uh, and he's also great. He'll tweet with you all the time if you want to also. Um, so thank you again, Andy, for joining us. We're going to go play a little more Division 1.1 and we'll be right back. To- S&D Podcast is no way affiliated with, associated with, produced, or endorsed by the National Hockey League or any of its affiliates. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the S&D Podcast. Dan here with Steve. That was a very good interview we just had with Andy. Yes. That was uh, definitely a great tone for getting ready for the semifinals uh, in the Eastern and Western Conference, and along what the Islanders are going to be doing this offseason, and what, which was a very great year for the Islanders. Um, unfortunately, when I did the video podcast last week, we were going into Game 5. Uh, no, it was right after Game 5. Uh, yeah. We are going into game six. Um, good thing it was a little bit after, ga- uh, like an hour or two after game five, because I would have been a lot worse than what it really was. Um, but th- thanks thanks again to Andy for coming on. That was a very good insight. If you haven't checked his website out, definitely check it out. It's eyesonisles.com. It's not just Islander stuff. They, they, they do pretty much around the league. Obviously, they're going to do more on their stuff, of course, because it's about the it's on their website. But they do not uh, 
discriminate towards other teams. They do have the uh, predictions up for the rest of the league as well. So definitely check that out. They're both, they're all good writers. Andy's a great guy. Um, before we even did, conducted the interview, we were talking to Andy for a good 10, 15 minutes and we we're just, uh, shooting in the wind. And he, he's a generally a genuine, uh, nice guy. And he's definitely, we'll definitely have him on again. He uh, was a great guest. Yes. Um, we'll definitely have him on, uh, like we said in the interview for the finals, we'll do a, like we'll try and get him on right before the finals starts to do a preview of that series, whatever it will be. Also, look out! I'm gonna post on the Twitter and uh, Facebook uh, pages his predictions in the rounds, not the games that are gonna be won, just the matchups that he expects in the in the Eastern and Western finals and the NHL finals. Um, but we will definitely have him on for the finals, uh, and hopefully, some point over the summer, we'll have him on to talk the NHL as well. Um, Especially, definitely before the season as well. Next year, we should definitely try and get him back. Um, Tonight's show was a lot of fun. I know Dan's ready to go to bed and wake up in a good mood for the Knicks tomorrow. Yeah, hopefully. Um, You just got to believe and just take it one game at a time. And hopefully the Knicks get on a hot streak that we've been waiting for. You've seen this with the Knicks all season long. We would go for a week stretch of just crappy basketball. Then we win almost 20 in a row. I'm not saying that's going to happen. God knows I want that to happen, obviously. But hopefully that starts something tomorrow night. Um, And fight for another day. And we, we get to play Indiana again and keep alive for at least one more game. Um... I could see the Knicks coming back and winning in seven, but the Knicks themselves have to hope and see that happening. Um, it's easy for us to say that because we're not in the actual locker room. And right now, the team mojo looks very crappy right now. And the, and uh, I think it was after the game yesterday, someone tweeted out that uh, J.R. Smith's uh, shooting percentage in the series went up like 0.3. So now he's shooting oh, yeah. 24%. Oh. But before I forget, uh, I don't know if you saw. Did you see? Uh, did Jr. miss a shot? Yes, there is a Twitter, uh, Twitter and I, I actually followed it during <laughs> the game, and it was pretty funny. It would, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, okay, thank God, yes, oh God, why he missed that shot? It was kind of funny. Oh, Jr. <laughs> it's gotten to that point. And do you and 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 uh, the topic of the week? Do you think he got? Uh, did he give the pipe to uh, Rihanna? Well, yeah, because look how bad he's playing. He definitely got the pipe. <laughs> gave the pipe. Uh, yeah, he's obviously packing heat. Uh, Boomer um, Carden uh, showed it on air today. If you didn't see all your um, all, if you don't show your girlfriend these pi- these pictures, because they'll leave you. So be careful. <laughs> anyway, that's our show tonight. Go Knicks. Um thanks again, Andy. Um check out his website, Eyes on Isles, and check him out on uh Twitter. We have him on uh both of us follow him on Twitter and the S and D podcast yes, has him follow, follow us on Twitter, like our Facebook, share our pages, Instagram, Vimo, everything. Share everything with everybody. Um have Thank you to Schmuck time. Sports again. Um, yes. As always, um, without them, we wouldn't be having this podcast. And of so course, Vision 1.1 for the amazing music. I do know they're in the studio right now. All right, awesome. Working on music. Um, still in talks with them. We will, we will get them on soon. Uh, also, another person we're going to get on soon is Frank, the winner of our NCAA bracket. Um, I know he wanted to come on and talk Yankees, and we really haven't had much time to do baseball. But now that the Islanders are out, we could possibly start with baseball next week a little bit more, even though we don't really want to talk Mets. Of course. <laughs> um, so, this that was this week's show. Um, let's go play a little more Division 1.1, and we'll see you guys next week.